My name is Dana J. Smithers and my company name is Empowered Women in Business. And what I love to do is interview women that are contributing in a very, very meaningful way to uh, helping other women, other people heal, and basically helping create a healthy planet uh, for all of us that are going through sometimes difficult times. And today's topic is about grieving. And I'm absolutely delighted to have as my guest today, Deborah Harney Greger, who is going to be talking about um, the loss of hopes and dreams, which is what grieving is all about. That's how she described it to me. And I thought, you know, that's just perfect because it's not just always about the grieving over somebody that's passed away or a person, an animal, but it can be about situations that change, circumstances, um, lifestyle shifts, um, getting older, having a baby, moving. It can just be so many things that actually come into that big umbrella of loss of hopes and dreams. So get ready for a very, very interesting show. Um, Deborah is an expert in this field. She is a grief coach and a celebrant. And Deborah, I'm just going to start with asking you to tell us how did you get into this business? Because it's not the most fun place to go. So <laughs> what, what attracted you? Thank you, Dana. To be honest, I attended a service uh, for a young fellow about 20 years ago. And what I got from that service was I left feeling empty and I didn't know that person at all. And I knew that person well, but nobody in that church knew that person because they didn't really tribute his life. And I walked away and I said to my friend, my God, everybody deserves to have to celebrate their life because we're all here for a reason. We're not born just because we, we're going to leave an imprint on the planet. So from that point on, I started to help others and assist started with my family members and friends and assist others in really designing um, a celebration of life service that that really memorialized that person right it wasn't a cookie cutter service and it those people walked away knowing because it's the last time you get a chance to celebrate that person's life in that capacity with all your relatives so make it great that's that. what I decided. And so that's the celebrant part of it. Now, you and I were talking a bit earlier about how long people grieve. So when does it stop? Is there a time period to it? I don't think grieving ever stops. I think it's just something that we integrate into our lives and we work with it. You know, I'm a widow. I grieved for years and years and years. And I asked myself the same question, Dana. Am I ever going to stop feeling this way? And, you know, I just actually, I'm grateful for everything I have and I work with it in my life. And I just, if I'm feeling sad, I allow that sadness to be present. We're a culture that likes to fix things. We like to get well really quickly. And that's not what grieving's about. Grieving is a taskmaster and it'll rear its ugly head whenever it decides to. And you can prepare all you like but five, 10, 15 years down the road, it might come up. And I think it's important just to acknowledge the love for that person and how you're feeling in that moment. Right, I, I really love that you said that, Deborah, because I, I'm also a certified emotion coach, emotion code practitioner, and I, and, uh, I do offer Reiki as well. And when I'm working with uh, women in particular that are grieving the loss of a, a husband, a spouse, or sometimes even an animal, it's, they're, they're saying that their neighbors are saying, well, get over it. It's been long enough. And it's like, I just say, there's no time limit on this stuff. And who is somebody to tell you what you should feel like? But even as an emotion code practitioner, there are triggers Oh yeah. that come up. There's holiday seasons, there's birthdays, there's special occasions, any number of things that can get us going on that. So what could be some tips that you could share for, for grieving on any occasion, Deborah? I think the first and foremost thing that I would recommend for anybody is to really tap into how you're feeling in that moment. And if you're not feeling like attending, don't go. Honor yourself, nurture yourself, love yourself, be within yourself. 
I, and I know the holidays are around the corner and, you know, a lot of people have said that to me, what do we do? Honor the person that's passed away, you know, um, contribute, uh, do a donation to a nonprofit organization or something that afflicts that person in their name just to honor that person, you know. There's a ton of things that we can do, but one of the things I advise people not to do is not to not talk about it. Right. You know, don't let that elephant in the room take over the room. Acknowledge it, acknowledge that person that's passed away. When I pass away, I hope people will remember me in a nice loving way and talk about me like I'm still here. And that's what I tell other people too. It brings them right. comfort. Yeah. Great, I, I do love that. I remember when um, the first Christmas that my father um, had passed, uh, he passed in early December and the family was getting together. We flew in from all different places and we had it at the, the family home. And at the family home at Christmas, I mean, put out the silver, you know, the good dishes, uh, you know, a little bit of champagne, things like that. And, you know, I just set the table the way I normally did because that was my job. And my mom walked in and she goes, uh, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, you just said dad's place. And I go, ah. I said, well, I guess he wants to join us, right? Because it, it, we just left it. It was just done and that's where dad sat and, you know, that's what we did. And then another year when my mother had, my mother had passed, um, we decided not to do the traditional things. We decided that we would go out, nice restaurant, get dressed up. I wore all mom's jewelry that she'd given me. So I kind of brought her to the nice. occasion it was a lot of gold and green. So it, so it worked for that Christmas. And uh, we just remembered her and we toasted her and I didn't feel the sadness that I think I would have if, as you said, the elephant in the room just sits there and the energy that we're feeling is just horrible. Horrible. Right? Just horrible. guilt and so many yeah. things going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good for you. So Deborah, I wanna ask you about uh, most of us or, well, a lot of us know who Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was, right? She was one of the uh, pioneers of what we, what became to be known as the grief cycle. So, you know, I know I've talked about that before, you know, the anger, the depression, the acceptance and all of that that goes on, but you look at it from a different perspective. So could you please share that with us? Well, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a Swiss psychologist who really revolutionized the way the medical system approached the terminal ill. And she came up with the five stages of grief, specifically for people that were transitioning and ready to die. And we've taken it and used it in our modern day culture. And that's not what it was intended for. But since then, because you know, people look at it like it's a system and as you know Dana grieving is not that way and so somebody might be have lo experiencing loss and they think oh my god you know I should be in anger but I'm not I'm actually feeling a little relieved because I watched that yes, person yes sick for so long and now I'm feeling like oh god there's got to be something wrong with me I'm screwed up no they're not so she came up with a few more which along with the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, there's shock and denial, there's pain and guilt, there's anger and bargaining, there's depression, reflection, and loneliness. And then the upward turn is reconstruction of your life and working through your loss and the acceptance of your loss and then hope for your future. You know, so there's a few more oh, added. That's, it's, that's beautiful. You know, I hadn't heard of that. Yeah. Part. So when you do as a grief coach, those are are those stages that you take people through. You find out where they're at, how they're feeling. I let people. I let pe people are the. I let people lead the way. You know, and um, when people, a lot of people experience guilt when they're grieving. Guilt, like especially people that have experienced sudden loss something's happened suddenly, they've either lost a pet suddenly, they've lost their spouse suddenly. And guilt is the fly paper, the sticky paper that keeps people stuck in grief. Oh, okay. You know, so I always work on another process called the peace method and it helps people to look at the contrary of how they're feeling. 
you know, and which helps them give a different perspective to what's right. going on. Oh, I love that. And, you know, that actually segues really nicely into, I'm also a, a law of attraction a life coach and a yes. trainer. And so when we look at, um, you know, the feelings around it all, right? One of the things with, with law of attraction that works to get to know what we do want is we always create a list of what we don't want. Absolutely. And so on the one hand, it's all right, I, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to have his clothes around. I don't want to be reminded of this. Um, I don't want to, to do uh, cook dinner the way I used to, right? So all of those things are great. Look at the contrast. And then we go to, well, what do you want? And mm. once we can start getting rid of all what we don't want and what do we want, and it can just be a little baby step. Absolutely. Right? There, yeah. As you said, there's no time for grieving. There's no steps or ways that you have to do it. It's absolutely individual. And, you know, just what do you want? And I like what you said about, you know, reconstructing things, right? And, and you know, if, if um, grief is about, you know, the loss of hopes and dreams, then to me, there's always two sides of a coin. Yep. Right. So that's what could be. But let's aspire to new hopes and new dreams. Right. Because that's what keeps human beings moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, Donna, as we love, we will lose. We, loss comes with love. Yeah. You know, and as we get older, we're going to experience more loss. And we are a generation of baby boomers. So it's yeah. how we handle things that make the difference in how we enjoy our lives moving forward. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, there's no, you know, nobody can tell you how much loss you're going to feel about this particular person or that. Um, I know that for me, there were different experiences and emotions that I had when my father passed as when my mother passed. Uh, for me, my mother was lingered much longer. It, Yeah, there was just so much with my mother, even though I had a very strong love for my father it was just different but with my mother maybe because my mother was in palliative care and hospice for so much longer whereas my father had a heart attack and you know so there's different ways that people will will leave the earth and pass and so we don't know what how we're going to grieve or how we're going to feel or some people may just feel numb yeah yeah nothing yeah. So, Deborah, what happens when we're around, uh, you know, some people are uncomfortable being around people that are grieving. So yeah, what, tip, what suggestions could you give for that? Well, you know, typically because we are a culture that likes to fix things quickly. Yes. And we want to make somebody feel better. And there really is no way to make somebody feel better other than knowing that you're there for them, you know, and sometimes we say all the wrong things. I know I was guilty of that before, uh, you know, I years and years and years ago um, saying, you know, things like it's OK it, because it's it's not OK. No. It's it's not OK. It negates their feelings at that time. You know, uh, another thing that sometimes we say to people are um, uh, glad you had him for so long or lucky you had her for so long. <laughs> that's not another good one. No, what about the length of time that's left that, that you'd plan to have that person in your life? Yeah. Or, you know, you're, you're still young. You can find another partner. Oh, my God, I heard that for myself. Yeah. I just wanted to, I knew my friends were well-meaning, yes. but I just wanted to clobber them, to yeah. be honest well, with you. Yeah, or, well when friends. are you going to move out of the house? You know, like, are you are you getting tired of living in here with all of his memories? No. Sometimes you want to be surrounded yeah. by that person's memories. For some of us, we do because we still feel comforted that they're with us. Yeah. There's a ton of things that we unconsciously do that are not supportive to yeah. helping those that uh, have lost somebody. And they're all well-meaning yes. statements, yes. Yeah. but we don't understand how they hurt other yeah. people. So some of the things that you can say that would help somebody is, I don't know how you're feeling because you don't. I know that you're strong. 
and you have a support system and I'm, I want to be on it. You know, is there anything that I can do for you? And state two things, you know, because people that are grieving, their minds are a mishmash of confusion and emptiness and they need like you do with your coaching, Dennis, to take somebody but their hand and to help them. They need that. So state two things that you you will do. Walk their dog and bring them a meal, something. Oh, help like them. Yeah. Yes, and help them, you know, ask, ask them. Let them be your guide. And sometimes people don't want to ask for help. Yes. But, you know, when my husband died, I did hospice for 20 years and the fellow that ran Crossroads Hospice, he called me every single week. And it was like, hi Deb, this is Pete. I'm just checking in on you, seeing if you're okay. Yeah. That meant the world to me. Oh, so I'm, just, I'm glad you're saying that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. just checking in with somebody. And just another thing Deb, on that, I have a friend who's been grieving the death of her daughter. And oh. her daughter was sick for a, a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And uh, I just send her a text. Yes. You know, when I don't hear from her, I know that she's probably feeling a bit depressed, but I feel it's important that she knows I'm here. And if I don't hear back, I don't push it. I don't then phone her and say, you know, I haven't heard from you what's going on. Yeah. Uh, but I do check in and yeah. I do just do the text for us that works. Um, you know, for somebody else, it might be email or it might be just leaving a message. I know that when I've felt that way, often I, I won't answer the phone. I don't want to communicate. I don't want people around. And then, you know, when that person is ready, let them reach out, right? And then, you know, but it's an individual choice how we grieve and how we, you know, how we get back to having our hopes and dreams. And when that happens, we have no idea. Yes. And, and that's something that I really love. I, I am an emotion code practitioner. I know that you are uh, just about finished. Uh, I'm going to be offering that. And I find that so helpful that, you know, the triggers will come up, holiday seasons, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, whatever your religion is. Oh, that's something I wanted to ask you about. What about customs with different religions? How, okay. how does that work? Well, that's different, you know, because I'm a celebrant and I do services, everybody has their own way of doing things. And, you know, the, the Hindus, they have a beautiful ritual around bathing the body and shrouding it in uh, cotton that has no seams. And, and then they wait for about nine days before they burn the body. They have this thing with fire, earth and water. And so they wait till they feel the soul is ready to leave and then they, they will burn the body and it has to be done by the son, the, a, a male figure in the family. And then they pray and they celebrate. Jewish people, it was funny, you know, when I first did a Jewish, attended a Jewish service, I was doing grief support for this one gal and, you know, I asked her if she needed any help and she said, no, we've got it all organized. So I booked for a session with her and her husband for the following week. Well, that night she told me that he had passed away, that they were having the service the next day at one o'clock in the afternoon. I, I couldn't believe it. Mm. And I attended the service and they bury their people very quickly. It's very yes, uh, non, yeah. nondescript within 24 hours or within a few days and they will cremate and then they do a shiva after seven days they will pray and they create a beautiful space for people to express how they're feeling they and tell stories around the person that's passed and the love that they had for that person um the buddhas i attended my uh my monk i had a beautiful monk in my life for 12 years and he passed away on the phone with me one night um after my husband died he called me to ask me why i was still unhappy I said, easy for you to say, you've never been married, you've been celibate. And he said, no, no, he said, you know, he's gone to the new world. And he talked about impermanence and um, we as human beings um, uh, have a hard time being happy because we always want more, 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 and we want things to end, you know, we want to get over these feelings quickly. So that was the biggest, honest to God, Dana, lesson that I'd ever learned from him in my life was impermanence because the minute he hung up the phone he had a massive heart attack and he died talk about bizarre my goodness so i found myself flying to santa rosa 
and I was in a room with about 400 Thai people and we ate like the food just kept coming, coming, coming in this temple. I kept thinking, why is there so much food? Well, that service, the first day started at one o'clock in the afternoon and went till 11 o'clock at night, the first day. And then the second day, it went from nine o'clock in the morning till midnight. And there was a whole celebration in this big hall. Mm -hmm. And we had to all go in and um, watch the burning of the body and the, you know, um, where they burnt it in the crematorium it was a massive, massive deal. And then they pray for about 39 days after. And then the Catholics, they celebrate uh, the death of their loved ones with, of course, a big funeral, lots of prayer. They believe if you've been good, you go to heaven. If you've been bad, you go to hell. You, you, you've sinned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so, and uh, typically the Italians put on a, a big service. They don't usually do anything in a small way. <laughs> you know, they do things in a big way. So everybody does things a little differently. But I think, honestly, whatever, because we are a changing generation now, our kids aren't going to do that. We do things that work for us, you know. So celebration services can be done on a beach, in the home, yeah. um, small, large, whatever. But typically they stick to the tradition of their generation. And of their faith as well. Of their that's, faith, yes. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And I, I think that it was nice to see years ago that instead of talking about, like my mother passed um, quite a while ago, over 11 years and even then we didn't call it a funeral I just said we're going to have a celebration of life and I don't know where I started to hear that but it's like no there's no you know none of that she didn't really want anything done but I just couldn't for me I couldn't just not acknowledge everything that she'd done in yes. my life and you know five kids and a husband and animals and animals and animals over the years and you know everything that that she did that it I wasn't going to not acknowledge it also for my own yes peace, peace of mind and just you know peace of heart right yes. that I felt like no and it, it did take quite a while before we actually you know we did have her cremated but it took a long time before we um we put her ashes on a friend's property under lilac trees, which she loved, and she really liked this person. And it was a nice peaceful meadow with some walnut trees and other uh, fruit bearing trees that, you know, she would have loved. And so it, it took us quite a few years actually to to finally do, you know, just come to terms with that, right? So it just, it isn't something that just happens overnight. No, and it's okay. And I'm, and, and when you take the time to do that for yourself, it's also a way for the family members to come together that they haven't, yes. you haven't seen each other. It's a gathering of yeah. people too. I know a lot of people will say, no, I don't want anything. Don't make a mess, you know, just, and some of my friends or my neighbors, because I've done a lot of people in my complex, we've honored those wishes, but we've also gotten together as a community within yeah. our complex to share stories and stuff. There's a healing that goes on. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. So, Deborah, you've got some books that you'd like to suggest for some of our yes. viewers. Well, here's my favorite one was On Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler. Yes, I've read that one. And anything by Alan Wolfett is amazing. You can get these books anywhere. Okay, can you just this... hold that up for a minute? And what's it called? Healing, Your, Healing Traumat Your Traumatized Heart. Okay. Right. And this one's Healing a Spouse's Grieving Heart. Same and author. who are these written by? Um, by Alan Wolfett, Felt, W. And can you spell o that? Alan, A-L-A-N-D, Wolfelt, W-O-L-F-E-L-T. And he's a PhD. And um, another one, 10 Practical Ideas to Heal Your Grieving Heart is a great one. There's so stuff he's that written we, quite a few books then. Oh, yeah, he's a great one. So that's his 100 Practical Ideas. Practical ideas, I like that. Yes, compassionate advice and simple activities to help you through your loss. And honestly, because it's such a bizarre and a crazy time, yeah. anything that you can get your hands on to make you feel better yeah. or hire a grief coach or an emotion code practitioner, yeah. anything that you can do to make yourself feel better while you're transitioning into your new life. 
yeah. is helpful. Oh, and I then, love that. And then Louise Hayes, God bless her, I loved her. Louise Hayes and David Kessler wrote a book, You Can Heal Your Heart. And that's about grief as well. That's a, a good one. There's tons of them out there. Yeah, that's good. Well, those are some great ones. I, I definitely have read uh, a few of those. I, I didn't. I like that one, the practical ideas, because sometimes yes. we just need, you know, even just if you get two or three tips, right? Simple reads. We need simple reads because our mind can only hold four to seven bits of information at a time. Yeah. So we need something really, really simple, you know. And here's one. Understand the difference between grief and mourning. People don't understand that, you know. And grieving is t totally different from mourning. Grieving is the internal experience. Mourning is the external experience. Now, can you imagine if we all walked around wow. downtown Vancouver mourning, wailing our heads off? But it is a part and process of the process. Yeah. and we're, But we're not allowed to do it, and we're ashamed to do yeah. it. But it's really, really necessary. Yeah, that's, also, that's interesting. So grieving is the internal yes. dialogue going on with us and mourning is what we do outwardly. I'm going to read exactly what okay. he says because it's really short. Grief is a constellation of internal thoughts and feelings we have when someone dies. So it's internal. Mourning is the outward expression of grief. Everyone has, Everyone who has the capacity to give and receive love grieves when someone loved dies. But if we are to heal, we also must mourn. And I'll tell you, that's one of the things when my husband died, I grieved. I grieved before he died. And yes. when and and then I grieved when he died. But I wasn't able to mourn because I had so many people showing up. You know, people my brother came to live with me for a month, but it was like for fifty six weeks. I didn't have time to cry because he was all he's yeah. a great guy and I love him, but he was always, Come on, Deb, let's yeah. go out and go for a walk and, and you know, try to cheer you up and I, I didn't have time, so I'd sit in the bathtub with the water going, with the cloth over my face, wailing my head off because it was just bubbling up to the surface, yeah. and I couldn't stop it, and I didn't want to stop it, but I didn't want to hurt my brother's feel. I didn't want him to yeah. try to fix me, yeah. you know, so it's important that people know that oh, it's that's person. That's just so great. I love that distinction. I never knew that. I know that... Uh, yeah, I did. I didn't know if those were the differences. I know sometimes I would just be in my car and just quietly. And uh, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm not really much of a crier, but during those times where you're just beyond being consoled, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the the crying and the, you know, just the the mourning. I guess the outward of that. Um, I finally got to that, uh, yeah. but I usually always stoic about things and you know whatever but be. it's it's not yes. healthy right oh yeah. it's not healthy it's like pushing that balloon down in water we have to express our human emotions because yeah. we're human beings yeah. but we're in a culture that minima minimalizes grief that yeah. doesn't understand it yeah definitely yeah. well deborah that's been so interesting and i've learned so much here so we'll have to have further conversations about this but how can people get a hold of you if they want grief coaching or a celebrant service? Through email, through email. I'm about to put up a website and get that all organized. In the process <laughs> of, yep. In the process So your of. email is debbyhg at shaw.ca. Yes. Terrific. And I will be uh, posting this up on my YouTube site, empoweredwomeninbusiness.com. So just look for... Uh, interviews with women women or topics on grieving. So thank you so much, Deborah. I look forward to you really uh, getting out there, providing this service to people. And I know that, you know, what the service that you have to offer is so needed. And this is absolutely the sacred gift of healing that. And the thing about a sacred gift is it's for the benefit of someone else. It's a benefit of a situation. It's meaningful to you and it brings joy to you. And the vehicle that you're finding is by, do you do things by phone, in person, Skype? Phone, phone in person, Skype. Yes, okay, I'll agree about yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So that's it for now. I'm Dana J. Smithers of Empowered Women in Business. Thank you, Dana.